Thank you very much to Heidelberg University and everybody else in the room for the opportunity to come and, and talk today. It's wonderful to talk to a group of folks who aren't all lawyers, um, which is a, a, a privilege for me. Unfortunately, I am a lawyer. Um, uh, my name is Tom Best. I'm a partner at Steptoe and Johnson, an uh, international law firm based in Washington, D.C., but with offices all over the U.S. and uh, London, Brussels, Beijing. And I spend most of my time, professional time and time, um, defending, investigating and defending FCPA cases, so foreign uh, transnational corruption cases. How does this work? There we go. Um, when I was thinking about what I wanted to talk uh, to you about today, uh, ho I was hoping I could tee up some interesting discussion. These things always work best when I talk least. Um, hopefully that's a, uh, a commentary on you and not me. Um, but we've heard a lot today about compliance and corporate compliance, and I actually happen to believe that compliance is not dead. Um, to use an Americanism, compliance may be like Elvis living in Kalamazoo, Michigan, but compliance is still out there. Um, and so the question I wanted to tee up today was really to set up a straw man uh, and then hopefully get your um, experience as sociologists and people from other disciplines um, about what drives an organization to do one thing or do another. Um, so the question that I wanted to set up what, uh, is and was, is a US style transnational anti-corruption enforcement system, so how we enforce the FCPA in the US and for those who are non-lawyers, uh, the FCPA is the U.S. Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which in very summary terms prohibits transnational companies from paying bribes to government officials outside the United States. And then if you do, you have to record your expenses properly and have a system of internal controls to make sure that all that bad conduct doesn't happen in the first place. Um, but you know, is, so, so the, the question for today is, is a, is a US style transnational anti-corruption enforcement system, um, which I'll explain, based on settlements, right, uh, in the public interest? Um, this is a topic that's a debate in the bar and becoming uh, uh, more recently really a debate uh, amongst NGOs and, and sort of the wider corporate and governance community about what the right way to A, punish wrongdoing is, investigate and punish wrongdoing, uh, but B, incentivize the behavior that we want, which is not doing this stuff in the first place. Um, a, bit, a bit of background, 15 years ago, um, U.S. FCPA enforcement, so trend, uh, enforcement actions, prosecutions uh, against transnational companies uh, and against individuals uh, were pretty few and far between. Uh, the U.S. Uh, had, had had the, uh, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act on the book since about 1977, so it's 40 years old now. But we'd seen from 77 to really about 03, 04, one, two, maybe three cases a year. Um, small dollar value was not a huge issue um, in a corporate compliance department. It wasn't something that companies paid attention to as a top line level risk. Now, if you look at that chart, um, beginning really in 04, 05, but certainly in 06, you see a, you see a big ramp up. Um, you see a big ramp up in the number of, uh, of enforcement actions of either prosecutions, and I'll talk about the, the different kinds of actions in a minute. Uh, but you see a lot more activity by uh, regulators and prosecutors. Um, inside this chart, uh, this chart, and what I think we, we want to explore today is sort of why that's the case. Um, there are lots of ways to explain why we went from one, two, three enforcement actions a year to now, if you look, uh, the numbers I'm giving you at the bottom there in the text are for 2016, where we've got over 50. Um, it goes up and down from time to time. Um, some people would say that the advent of Sarbanes-Oxley, which put individual directors on the hook um, for reporting not just actual misconduct, but sort of certifying to the status of a company's internal controls, um, but also the construction of a system in the United States, uh, an incentive system, which con uh, allowed companies, if they perceived some risk, if they found some wrongdoing, um, allowed them to come in, uh, and as Amy will discuss later, voluntarily disclose uh, conduct to the government, maybe do an internal investigation as well, um, for significant leniency, set up an enforcement system whereby 
companies knew or had significant likelihood of getting certainty, that they wouldn't be subject to trial and prosecution in the sort of traditional term that we think, it, uh, that we think about it. Right? So they wouldn't be hauled in front of a jury trial. Instead, they would be able to do a deal. And so what you don't see in these numbers but I think is important for this discussion, is in 2004, the US Department of Justice, instead of bringing a criminal prosecution requ or requiring a criminal plea, um, created a new kind of resolution. They called what's called a deferred prosecution agreement. Um, and they began to heavily incentivize companies to come in when they found something wrong in their organization and affirmatively tell them about it, get companies to tell on themselves. Um, what they ended up doing with significant leniency on the table and on the back end, if you didn't avail yourself of the voluntary disclosure regime um, uh, and the other sort of leniency that's available if you, um, uh, if you uh, abide by um, some of the benefits that they will give you is significantly worse financial penalties, potentially more individual prosecutions, um, much worse consequences than if you play by their rules. Um, most of these companies here, if you've been watching the headlines in the foreign corruption space, most of these companies here um, avail, but, but not all, um, availed themselves of this incentive system. Um, whereby they came in, they disclosed, they were, or they were being investigated, but ultimately they cooperated and did everything they possibly could to get the U.S. and now increasingly foreign governments, um, I'll talk about a couple of these in a minute, um, to reduce the penalties. They, they did everything they could to show that they were solid actors and that they deserved to not be prosecuted and instead um, receive either a deferred prosecution agreement, which um, is a set of charges laid out in public but put before a judge, which then says, okay, if you abide by a whole bunch of different conditions in here, um, you don't do it again, you don't do anything else that's related, you've told us everything about uh, the issue that's being investigated, and most importantly, um, you uh, abide by a very significant number of compliance conditions, organizational compliance conditions, we'll give you a break. Uh, so most of these companies in here, uh, if we were to apply the federal sentencing guidelines, the U.S. federal sentencing guidelines, um, had they not availed themselves of these incentive systems, cooperation, et cetera, would have ended up with much worse, uh, n not all, but much worse um, outcomes than what they ended up with. Um, none of these, uh, and not just none of these, but no company under the US FCPA in its 40-year history, um, maybe with one exception, but it was a closely held company tied to an individual, has ever actually taken a case to court and decided to fight it all the way in a criminal context. Um, there have been individuals um, who are threatened with losing their liberty and their property and certainly their personal <laughs> rep uh, reputation. Um, have and do take cases to court. Um, they will actually defend themselves in a classic sort of US style jury trial. Um, but companies just don't do that. Um, instead, they've got a system that allows them, if they do all the right things, and unfortunately pay people like us on the stage, um, to make sure they do the right things, whereby they don't have to do that. Um, this causes an enormous amount of, or is beginning to cause some real controversy because there's a perception out there um, being played up in the NGO and other communities that this may not be in the public interest. Um, so what are the, pro uh, and I'll start with the cons. Um, what, what are the cons of having a system whereby US prosecutors, if you're the Department of Justice, or uh, Securities and Exchange Commission enforcement officials, are effectively able to determine the terms of punishments that in most common law and certainly continental European legal systems usually would be determined and put in front of a judge. And we actually now have case law on the books in the United States. Um, this was a legal debate going on for a while whether or not judges had to affirmatively approve um, the terms that were put in front of, um, the terms that were struck between prosecutors and a company. Um, we actually have legal precedent on the books now that states that actually courts don't have um, for constitutional and legal reasons have virtually no authority or very, very limited authority to question whether or not um, 
a deal is in the, pub, in the public interest. So we really have, at the end of the day, a lack of judicial oversight of how foreign corruption cases uh, get settled. Some people have a problem with that. Um, and I think that's a legitimate criticism. Is it legitimate now that you've got um, a set of prosecutors in the Department of Justice or enforcement officials at the SEC who probably want law firm jobs uh, from people that they're sitting across the, the table with in a few years? Um, is it good for them to be able to make those de determinations? And do those determinations suffer from um, a lack of legitimacy? Is there a lack of, deter uh, of deterrent value when all the big banks are able to settle their LIBOR cases uh, with no senior executives that go to jail? Um, maybe one or two traders uh, are subject to, cr to criminal prosecution. Is that fundamentally unfair? Uh, that big companies, especially those that can pay and can pay, lar and can pay large phalanxes of overpriced Washington and other lawyers, um, is it fair that they are able to defend themselves in this way? Um, and ultimately, does this create a sort of true lack of accountability? Um, there may, there, uh, among some circles, there's probably a prop, uh, perception um, that big companies who are able to do these things uh, who are able to defend themselves, get off lightly, especially coming out of the global financial crisis, when otherwise they might not have been. Um, so those are the cons. This system, however, I think does have some real benefits that get played up and talked about. Um, and I'll take the US example first, starting back, say, in 2004. But these, con these pros, I think, really now, over the, certainly over the last five, six years, really apply to a whole new set of countries which are becoming very, very active in enforcing their own domestic corruption laws. I think we heard a lot about uh, Brazil last year, uh, yesterday. Uh, but also the UK, Germany, um, France is getting more active, the Canadians are getting more active. Um, there's a, now a groundswell over the last five, six years of other countries around the world actually enforcing their own anti-corruption laws. Um, but this, uh, having adopted in some cases something like a US model where companies have to come in, have to come in and disclose what's going on, work with the authorities in order to come to a resolution. Um, back before we had the system when the US was a pioneer, there, like a, uh, as the chart showed you before, there really were no uh, transnational FCPA prosecutions. Um, but over the last 15 years, we've ramped this up to where it is a constant feature um, uh, of the US enforcement docket at Justice and SEC. Uh, but it is also something that is top of mind in major multinationals risk controls. They, you know, every big company, as we heard about earlier, every big company's got, usually got something that says, thou shalt not bribe, and uh, sometimes, a lot of times, a fairly elaborate uh, compliance system in order to try to make that a reality. Um, and we can talk a lot about what, how effective those are absent some specific conditions uh, in, in a minute. Um, so those are the pros and the cons about this kind of, uh, about this kind of enforcement system, which is just based on lo company lawyers coming in, talking to prosecutors, um, completely out of ju judicial oversight with the prospect of receiving more lenient treatment, not based on criminal charges, not go and not blessed by a judge. Some of the pros and cons. Um, ask the question, with respect to these kinds of cases in transnational bribery, are they special? Is there something about them that makes them special, that we want to handle these cases in a different way, such that, um, you know, in a different way than we would handle street crime or drug crime or some of the other things you see on, you know, on television um, when you're sitting in your hotel room? Um, I would argue that there are some distinct features about these big multinational cases. When the FCPA came into force in 1977, it was a, a novel concept that a country would actually sit back and say, you know what, I care about my, what all my, my corporations and their foreign subsidiaries do overseas. Um, I, I care about that and I want to be able to prosecute and or bring civil penalties against them. Um, they suffer from a lot of difficulties. It, these are hard cases to aid detect. They're hard cases to uh, investigate. They're very complicated. Uh, for these, this is from the, the, the governmental perspective. They're hard to detect, hard to know about them. The conduct is almost by definition overseas. Um, 
uh, they're hard to gather evidence about. A lot of times you've got to get information out of banks, which have, you know, strict, can't have strict banking secrecy laws, so you have to work between sovereigns. Um, you get to work through judicial channels, which can take a very, very long time. Um, so there are lots of sort of barriers, practical blocking and tackling barriers to actually, if you're a Department of Justice or UK Serious Fraud Office or Munich Public Prosecutor, if you're somebody seeing there's a lot of practical barriers to actually learning about these cases, gathering the evidence to bring them, and then bringing them to a conclusion. Um, so I would argue that they are special. This is how, this slide here, is how some of these, how these cases t typically come to light. Um, a lot of times it's not a government learning about something first. Um, there's a whole legal framework that's been constructed in the United States, certainly amongst companies that have publicly traded securities, that incentivize people to, actually monetarily incentivize people if they see something that looks like a violation of US securities laws. And oddly, the US Foreign Corrupt Practices Act 6 sits within the, foreign, uh, the securities laws of the United States. Um, you can recover if, 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 the, if you bring a tip to the SEC, <laughs> and the SEC uses that information and it leads to an enforcement action whereby they recover more than a million dollars, you can get, in their discretion, up to 30% of that recovery. Um, so we've, you know, in classic US fashion, we've decided that we're gonna pay people to snitch on their own companies instead of working inside their corporate uh, compliance systems. Um, you know, but we've also, in, now, um, as we'll talk about, we've also put together um, and incentivized the construction of a whole compliance industry, which, frankly, is probably more responsible now for things coming to light than just the tr traditional law enforcement me mechanisms in the past. Um, so, when faced with this kind of these kinds of, sort of special attributes of these kinds of cases where they're hard to detect, hard to prosecute. I would posit that maybe a system which gives great benefits to companies that find things and where there is some threat that it will come out in the press and, uh, and then come to the, the attention of government, either by whistleblowers, by internal audit departments, by the NGOs, um, the cases in Brazil, uh, over the last few years have been driven a lot by just press reports. The internet has fundamentally changed sometimes how, come, how issues come to light. I would posit that a system that in heavily incentivizes companies to bring issues to light and fully cooperate with the government, um, and now governments around the world, um, is a solid trade-off where even though you lose some of the pro, even though you lose some of the attributes that we otherwise would really like, to have, like judges actually signing off on criminal pleas or deferred prosecution agreements or non-prosecution agreements. Um, you may lose some legitimacy. Um, uh, you may lose some judicial oversight. And for, uh, near and dear to my heart is, you know, what's odd about the US Foreign Corrupt Practices Act is we've got a statute that's on the books. There have been now over a few hundred resolutions, not prosecutions, but resolutions. And yet we are still in a position where, because we don't have litigated cases, corporate corporations settle, we're still in a position where we don't have basic case law, it's a common law system, so you want case law to know what the act says. Uh, we don't have basic common law judicial decisions for basic terms, basic attributes, basic elements of the statute. Um, I trade all of that. Um, because now what we do have is we have a system whereby we went from a place where we had very little enforcement back up through 2004 to the sort of construction of this incentive system whereby now we have, hundred, we have many, many, many uh, significantly um, ramped up numbers of cases that get brought every year. Now, numbers alone, of course, don't tell the story. So why is that important? And numbers alone really don't necessarily have any value. Yellow card, five minutes, perfect. Um, so why is this valuable? I would posit it's valuable because, as I said before, one of the key terms of any corporate resolution is um, not only do you have to sign up to not do it again and turn over all the information about uh, the people in the organization who might have done wrong, 
you've got to sign up to very onerous compliance conditions. You as a big multinational have to say, we are going to ramp up our internal controls, we're going to ramp up our anti-bribery specific compliance program, and a lot of times in many of these resolutions, um, we're at least going to have to tell you, report to you, U.S. and other governments, that we're doing a really good job and they, that they can then ask questions. Sometimes the government will require a monitor, will require an independent expert to come in and sort of kick the tires on how the company's doing from a compliance perspective. Um, I would argue that this lack of judicial oversight system that we've created, um, if you're looking for a case for why it's a really good thing, um, we've created a compliance industry. I wouldn't be standing here today um, if we didn't have this odd system, uh, admittedly with flaws, um, uh, that has made corporate compliance and anti-bribery and transnational compliance in particular, made it something that every company cares about and every company spends an enormous amount of time and money, well, n not every, I should qualify my words, some, uh, well-governed ones do, trying to get their people to at least know what right and wrong is and create that kind of ultimately culture. Uh, create that culture um, which uh, causes these things to happen less. Um, as a coda to all of this, I will say, in my experience, defending big companies, some of which unfortunately have had settlements that have gone and become public, some of which have had investigations, the companies that have had the biggest cultural change, where they've gone from one place at the beginning of an investigation, where, I mean, I'll tell a, a story. I remember sitting in Nigeria as a junior lawyer, having gone through all the documents, and I was gonna interview my first few witnesses, and I was all excited. And I got in front of the base manager of this fairly large operation of a US multinational in Lagos, Nigeria, and I started asking him questions, and he looks at me, and he just says, I know I'm not supposed to do this, but everyone does it. It's Nigeria, what am I supposed to do? Um, and you know, of course I told him, well, this is the law and whatnot, and this is why the company cares. I then had the same conversation with that individual five years later. He survived the investigation and disciplinary process in the company. Then had the same conversation with the indiv same individual five years later. He was still in a senior position out in the field. Um, and he said, you know what, Tom, I will never forget the first time you came in here. Uh, you were some pinhead lawyer from Washington. And I thought, why on earth should I actually pay attention to this guy who's never been to Africa and doesn't know what it's like out here? And then, my see and two things happened. I got a notice in the mail that I had to preserve every single document I ever had relating to a particular business relationship because the US Department of Justice and the UK Serious Fraud Office were looking at what we were doing. And my CEO got up and every three months gave a presentation that I either had to stand and watch in person uh, or uh, I had to watch online and certify that I'd watched it. And when, I, and when I was told that I would lose my job, potentially be prosecuted and or certainly not get a promotion until I towed the line, um, until I did that, I wouldn't have paid attention to you and I, I, I dismiss you, but now I understand what you were doing. So I would posit to you that this system of enforcement, of more enforcement actions at more companies in more places and now in more countries over time has basically created the compliance industry. And if you're looking for a reason to defend what has become sort of the effectively the accepted way for these large multinational criminal transnational bribery and other investigations to get resolved. Um, maybe it's the compliance case that is um, the way we want to defend it because I do believe um, more, we would not have the same attention to compliance and probably wouldn't have the same attention um, and probably behavioral changes in certainly some of those companies um, without it. Okay. I'm not gonna get a red card, right? Okay, good. Thank you.